is John Timpane. And he's Don Rooney. And this is The Musical Intertube. Now you may ask, why is this podcast called The Musical Intertube? And we may reply, because that's its name, of course. Now, how did this podcast get that name? Back in college, we hosted a radio show. Once, we tried to introduce a soothing musical interlude. Instead, we messed up and wound up introducing a soothing musical intertube. And the name stuck. So, here we are, hundreds of years later, still talking. Talking to interesting people about their interesting lives. Difference makers who really make a difference. Today, the musical inner tube is very excited to have novelist, newsmaker, and public intellectual Jean Kwok with us. Her best-selling novels include Girl in Translation, In Search of Sylvie Lee, and Mambo in Chinatown. And she has a new one coming in October, now titled The Leftover Woman. She's had much to say about the Asian American experience, and lately she has found herself in the midst of the great American free-for-all about books in our local libraries. We are truly happy to welcome Jean Kwok to the Musical Intertube. Hello, Jean. Hi, John. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, we're, we're thrilled. Um, let's get right to it. I'd like to know, how did you, because you, you split your time between the United States and Holland, correct? Yes, I do. And, and how did you land in front of the Central Bucks District School Board? What were you talking about? How did that, that was, that's not far from where we are. And, you know, you, you pop it's up. It's a Philadelphia suburb, yes. Yeah, I saw your name in the Inquirer. Um, tell us what that was all about and what you were there to do. Well, um, I found out not very long ago that my debut novel, Girl in Translation, which is taught in schools around the world, um, was one of the books that was being challenged in Central Park, Pennsylvania, to be removed from their school libraries. Um, and I was contacted by a parent who used to be on the school board herself. And she, you know, just asked very politely, she said, this is happening. I would like to mount a defense for your book. Um, and would you like to write a short statement? that I could read uh, during that meeting. And I said, yes, absolutely. Let me think about it. I'll get back to you. And then, you know, I sat down, I was writing the statement and then like, I got more and more fired up as I was writing down, <laughs> like why I thought they should not be doing this. And, uh, you know, I just started to think, you know, they really shouldn't be doing this. Why are they calling my book pornographic? Like, this is so ridiculous. Um, and just, Coincidentally, that board meeting was this past Tuesday, and I had already been planning to be in Florida for this week because I have to give, I had to give a talk at Florida State University. So I was already planning to be in the U.S. and I thought, you know what? I, I could move those tickets. You know, I could actually go to Pennsylvania and deliver my statement myself. Um, and so I asked. The parent who was involved, Tracy Suits, who is kind of, you know, saving books one at a time um, from being removed. And I said, this is, I've got this really crazy idea, Tracy. Do you think it's too crazy? Like, what if I actually came? And she was like, I love crazy ideas. Um, and <laughs> she, <laughs> yeah, she helped me figure out the logistics of how to do it. Wow. Uh, how do you think you did? Did you persuade anyone? You know, it's really hard to say. I think, um, I think that to give everyone in Central Bucks credit, the truth is that everyone there is united in their passion, right? They're, they're passionate about their children. They're passionate about education. Sadly, they are divided in terms of what they think should happen in terms of educating their children, but it comes from a deep place of caring. And I think that um, I was really treated with respect, although there was some trolling on um, social media. But basically, they, you know, they listened to me. And I, I don't know, you know, in the end, nothing can change. And the fact is, I did not go there for my book. I mean, of course, I would love to save my book, but that was not at all the reason I went. I went because I think that this, that, challenging books is wrong and that they books should not be removed from school libraries at all and i went because i knew that i have a pretty defensible book and that my career is in a strong enough place that even if they were to knock me down i could take it um 
And so, you know, it's not about my particular book. It's about calling attention to this situation. I really don't think that things will be undone in Central Bucks. I mean, I hope they would be, but I'm not that naive. I do hope that we bring enough attention through things like this podcast that people around the country are thinking, whoa, hey, is that happening? Do I need to vote for my school board? And that maybe the video that's made of me speaking could be used in other instances. Did, did you get a feeling from the people of the Central Bucks School Board when you were talking to them or when you were attending the meeting as to what they're thinking when they're talking about banning specific books, what it is in the books that's offending them or making them want to ban it? Well, you know, what's happened, as far as I understand it, right, what has happened is that um, there is usually a policy for what happens if a parent is unhappy with a book, right? And that has always existed. Parents have always had the power to say, I don't want my child reading this book. And then it, it's done. It's fine. No problem, right? The new step has been taken recently um, all across the U.S., where, you know, books are actually challenged for removal so that they're taken out of the school library and nobody can read them, right? That that choice is no longer there because the book isn't there anymore. And what Central Bucks did, as far as I understand it, is that just this past summer, they made, they changed the policy um, in a way that makes it very possible to remove books. And so what they did was they removed um, the criteria that the book has to have, you know, the, the criteria of literary merit, so that what whoever's in the committee that's evaluating the book, they can no longer say, yes, there might be some violence and some sex in this book, but we believe the literary merit of this book outweighs the, you know, the other. No, that's that's not a consideration. You're not allowed to consider it. It's not in the policy. So you have to consider the sexual content of the book and, you know, some other factors. Then they create this committee, which I think it's changeable, but can be made of librarians and teachers and the people you would want on an evaluation committee like this. But number one, they have to follow this policy, which does not allow them to consider literary merit. And number two, if a book passes that committee and the original book, complainer decides to appeal, all they have to do is appeal and then the school board decides. So the school board has this very nice statement of, oh, we're not involved and it's the committee that's deciding. But that's not really true because the school board can has a mechanism for overruling that committee just by a simple vote. And there's no, you know, requirement for them to have read the book, to you know, there are no rules in that. They can just decide. I mean, that was one of the things that was shocking to me is that somebody can complain because of what they heard from someone else. Uh, a parent can complain uh, based on what they have seen on a website or have heard from another parent. No one has to have read the book, actually, which it's, you know, uh, well, what can we say? It's it's they should. I There's no way you can, by law, require people to have read a book to complain about it, but you'd think that they would. <laughs> that would give them somewhat and, and, more standing, right? <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And one of the one of the things that I thought was really kind of, you know, ridiculous for those of us who love books, that's also in that policy, is that if a book is found to be, you know, necessary to be removed, it will be replaced with a similar book, only without the bad content. It's like, <laughs> excuse me, that's like saying, well, I can just murder you and put another guy in your place and it'll be the same. It'll be, you know, <laughs> yeah. be, you know, and no one's, uh, you know, just slightly different. Let's just find it. I mean, how can you replace one book with an equivalent book? I mean, it's not like, we're not talking about, you know, chocolate chip cookies and then cookies no. without chocolate chips here. It's not exactly a readerly solution, is it? It's, uh, you know, <laughs> anybody who reads it all knows that, you know, books are far from the same, even if they tell the same story. I mean, I, I should tell our, our listeners that, uh, Girl in Translation is, um, a, it's an immigrant's tale. It's a family tale. It's a tale of growing up. And, and it's, uh, there, you know, there is sort of a, uh, a young adult love affair in there. But uh, to me, uh, it's, it's handled with, with taste and circumspection. And it's, it's not lurid. It's not especially detailed. And yet this is what, uh, 
people are bringing your book up for is that it's it, it's you know this lurid sexual romp, which of course oh, uh, I wish I were lurid. Oh my god, I, <laughs> I, I, I hate to be lurid. Like I'm so bad at being lurid. You know, uh. <laughs> I I do remember reading the newspaper account of your of your uh, talk in front of the. Uh, in front of the school board. And I think you said something like, do I look like a pornographer? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. But, but, but just, you know, not to be, again, it's kind of like not to be against pornographers. It's like asking, you know, do I look like a professional basketball player? You know, I personally do not look like a professional basketball player. Right. I, there was something else too in that report that I read where there was a, there's a, um, there, I, I, it's a group or a newsletter or something called Book Looks which is connected to a, a group of parents that are very active in trying to get books taken off shelves. Uh, and a lot of the the recommendations for books being banned comes from that listing that's in that book looks. Again, this goes back to these people not having even read the book, but just taking the recommendations of somebody else who maybe has an agenda and wants it removed. I think that's right. I do. I think, I think what you said is exactly right, Don. I think that there are people with an agenda who are pushing forward this um, movement. And, you know, when you take something like my book, which is actually an extremely innocent book in a lot of ways, you know, on, on that website, they, they searched through the entire book and they found four curse words out of 85,000. They found four pages of material in which there was pot smoking, a little bit of kissing, and one sexual encounter and the consideration of abortion, which actually the character does not go through with. And that's all they could find. So when they choose a book like mine um, to be challenged, it kind of makes you think, well, is there something else going on? And then what you're afraid of is that are they trying to silence certain voices and certain topics of, let's say, marginalized people, controversial topics? And, um, you know, then you wonder, is that the reason? Is that the real reason the book was targeted? But I do think that there are people who support the movement who have no idea that there's a political agenda behind it. And they, you know, they just honestly want to protect their children. Um, and they think, oh, no, that's a bad book. You know, that's a book that's meant to corrupt my child. And, you know, we need to get it out of there. And that was part of the reason I also went in person so that yeah, I could say this is what an author looks like. You know, this is what we're trying to do. We are not evil people. We are trying to do good. You know, um, I should also say that uh, Girl in Translation has been adopted by Dozens and dozens of high schools and and colleges, even a few senior courses in in uh, advanced schools, where it, it really has been taken as almost a model text, uh, looking at the immigrant experience, looking at the Asian experience in America. Uh, and it's interesting that none of that seems to matter. <laughs> in other words, the fact that other people think it's pretty good and works pretty well as a way to teach kids, right, doesn't count for nothing. You know, uh, in in a a discussion like this, you know, a, you know, a school board discussion with you know, parents in the room, it just doesn't come up to plate. Well, that that's why, you know, that's the problem with taking literary merit out of the out of the equation. Right. If you don't consider literary merit, then, yeah, you know, all books can fall. And, um, you know, there these this movement is not aimed at books like Fifty Shades of Grey, which has a great deal of sexual content or a hustler, you know, because you know why those books are not taught in schools like right. librarians, uh, they're not stocking those books in school libraries. The what's left and what's being targeted are books like mine, which are literary novels that perhaps question certain things in society or that are about people of color or immigrants or you know, just uh, with a, a different sexual identity than the mainstream. You know, all of those books are the ones that are being questioned now. Yeah, you don't go into a library and under literature see copies of Hustler. <laughs> it's exactly. Just, it's not there. Exactly. And I've not always found that disappointing. You know, I, I go in there. <laughs> I just can't find them. I just exactly. You know, I, I keep my hustlers between, you know, my Derrida <laughs> and my Shakespeare. You know, I just do this. Right. You know, Derrida, great companion. Right. <laughs> so now we know about John's home library, one that I will never visit. Uh, Gene, you as as a novelist, as any writer, 
can tell anybody who talks to any writer, there's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears that goes into any short story, novel, um, grocery list that a writer puts together. There's a lot of you in that book um, and a lot of time and effort and a lot of editing that goes on in your head as you're writing it. Should I say that? How should I say this? What should I include? What should I not? What should I infer? All that stuff goes into writing a good novel. And here you finally worked on it for years. You put the package together and somebody pulls out four quotes where you swear and two quotes where you kiss somebody and says, this book is no good. I guess this goes back to your talk about literary merit. It must hurt you deeply for people to take a book that you put such care into and dismiss it because of some very superficial, trivial things. No, I, I mean, I think the word outraged might be more fitting. <laughs> no, it's like, it, it's, you're absolutely right. And those four curse words, can I just say that two of them are body parts? They're yeah. not even curse words, right? I mean, I don't even have the F word in there. We, I really cleaned up the book. And also... Um, you shouldn't have mentioned elbows like that. It was just exactly, terrible no, what exactly. you did there. Exactly. And this was, of course, this was my debut novel. It was yeah. based on my own life in which, you know, I moved to the U.S. when I was five and we lived in the vermin-infested unheated apartment, apartment with no working central heating system in New York City, where it was freezing, freezing cold. We had ice on the inside of our windows. We had, you know, we turned on the oven and we left the door open and we had it on day and night in the winter. And it was the only way we could stop ourselves from freezing to death. And I worked in a clothing factory, you know, until like almost all of my childhood. Um, and that is what this book is based on. It's a book that I wrote for my mother who fell asleep over piles of clothing, well. basically also my entire childhood. Um, and indeed for it to be, you know, called pornographic, it's just outrageous. And it took me more than 10 years to write this book. You know, this was really a labor of love. Um, I know every word that's in that book. And I thought about every word and every piece of it very carefully, exactly like you said, Don. We'll get right back to our podcast in just a moment. But now, here's a soothing musical interlude. Jean Kwok was born in Hong Kong and came with her family to the United States. She received her B.A. at Harvard and her M.F.A. in creative writing at Columbia University. Her first novel... Girl in Translation landed on many best-of-year lists and is taught in many countries and languages. She continued her success with the novels In Search of Sylvie Lee and Mambo in Chinatown. Her fourth novel, The Leftover Woman, will be coming out in October. Her work explores the lives of Asian women in America and examines issues such as language, culture, gender relations, and the politics of ethnicity. Jean splits her time between the Netherlands and the United States. She has won many awards, including the American Library Association Alex Award, the Chinese American Librarians Association Best Book Award, and an Orange New Writer's Title. Find out more about Jean at her website, jeanquok.com. That's J-E-A-N-K-W-O-K dot com. And now, we return you to the musical litter tube, already in progress. So, you know, uh, I want people to know that uh, your books and your life are, are, are near allied. You've, you've drawn on your life a lot to create your characters. Um, you came here. Uh, you had to learn English. You, you ended up going to Harvard and then Columbia. I mean, is that all? And <laughs> I'm just wondering, you started out on a science track at Harvard, but then you changed. You decided you wanted to do writing. My first question is, what did your parents think of that? And my, what was their reaction? Did they support you in, in that, uh, you know, uh, change? And secondly, why did you make that choice? Uh, obviously, writing was your dream, but I'd just love to know uh, why at that point did you say, you know, my career isn't going to be in science. It's going to be in writing. And I just love to hear more about that choice that you made because it was a big choice in your life. Yeah, well, it was, um, you know. It, that's a really interesting question. I mean, I grew up really poor and my, you know, my whole thing 
when I was young was that I wanted to get out of my life at the factory. There's a circle of life at the factory where you enter as a young child, you help your parents, you become, you go in your 20s, you're at your height, your physical height, you get the best paying jobs, which are also not very well paying. Um, and then when you're too old and too slow to do that, you get the worst paying jobs, like cutting thread off of clothing and hemming buttonholes. And my entire goal in life was to um, get out of the factory. And I understood from a young age that my parents had a dream for me. And, you know, that they knew that my life consisted of either working in the factory forever or their dream was that I could marry some man. And of course, I would probably still have to work, but I could cook for him, clean for him, bear him sons, definitely sons, not daughters, and take care of them, and that that would be a slightly easier life. And they despaired of ever finding a man willing to marry me because I was so bad at cleaning and cooking at all those traditional <laughs> activities. And I and I thought by myself from a young age, I thought, you know what? Those are my two choices. What am I going to choose? I thought, I'm going to go to Harvard instead. And so I made the choice from very young that I was going to get to Harvard because Harvard was the only school my parents had heard of, and it was the only <laughs> school they would allow me to go to. And when I got in, they were thrilled, not because, you know, it's a great university. They were thrilled because they would not need to find a man willing to marry me, which they had dis <laughs> like despaired of, like despair, like there have been long talks in the kitchen about how this is not going to go. Like, nobody <laughs> is going to walk on, like, ever. You know, so, um, so you know, when I so went going to Harvard, and I went in, like, Gung Ho as a physics major, I skipped a year when I went in, I took advanced standing, entered as a sophomore, I was ready to go, and one night, I was, like, up all night doing a problem set um, for physics homework, and I, my hand wrote a poem, and I was like, <gasps> Oh my God. <laughs> I felt like I laid an egg. I was like, what is that? Like, what was that? You know? Um, so I, like, I loved books. I loved reading, but it was not a choice. I didn't even know you could be a writer. Like, who's a writer? You know, I was, it's like an artsy fartsy thing where you make no money whatsoever. Like, not for me. So I was like, I, it, it was not on my multiple choice list of things to do with my life. But from the moment I wrote that poem, actually being a writer was the only thing I wanted to do. It was, I don't know, it was like having heroin or something, but I just never wanted to do anything else after um, writing that poem. So then I changed to English and decided to become a writer. I mean, did your parents understand? I might not have told them. <laughs> <laughs> do they know now? Uh, yes. Have you, have you <laughs> shared that you're not in physics? <laughs> You know, the truth is I, I paid my own way through college, right? So, um, you know, Harvard was great. They gave me maximum amount of money, but the maximum amount is not a full ride, right? There's always a child's contribution and a parent's contribution. And I had to pay my own contribution and that of my parents. So, you know, I worked four jobs for most of the time I was in college. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful for it. I mean, I had a great time. I had time to do everything I wanted to do, but I had a certain degree of independence because I was paying my own way um, and because my parents didn't speak English. So, you know, <laughs> some things are a little bit easier to get away with than others. Did you pull that trick where you told them that uh, you only get uh, your report card every two years or something? Uh. <laughs> I, did not, I did not send my report cards home. And I can tell you about the time I really got busted, though, which was that... Um, you know, so you know my life story is basically I went to Harvard, I graduated, I needed a day job, and I worked for three years as a professional ballroom dancer. Um, well, wait a minute, just for, for a moment there, I want people to know you didn't know anything about dancing when you into, went into that, right? That was, you had to be trained pretty much from the start. You, uh, is yeah. that true? Yeah. Well, I, I had, um, I, started dancing probably I started taking some ballet lessons when I was 16 but that is too old to really be a serious 
professional ballet dancer, but I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. And in college, I loved it. I danced for different troops and I took as many lessons as I could. And I have a good body for dance. I have good feet for dance. You know, some things, to, it, it, it is a gift that you are the right proportions and, you know, whatever. And so I, I loved dance, but I was not, you know, professional ballroom dancer quality. And indeed, it was a, it's a miracle. It's a miracle uh, they hired me. But we can come back to that. So let me yes, tell you about being completely. So I, so I, I, so I worked for three years of, as a professional ballroom dancer. And then I um, saw Professor Helen Vendler from Harvard, who had been a mentor of mine, at a Seamus Heaney reading. Yeah. And she said in her breathy voice, she said, Gee, what are you doing now? And I said, yes, well, I told her. And she was like, Gee. You must come back to the flock. And I thought, she's right. She's right. Like, I, what am I doing? I'm dancing. I need to be writing. So that was when I went back to Columbia. Um, and then I wrote a book later on called Mambo in Chinatown based on my experience right. being I love a professional book. ballroom dancer. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. And, um, and, you know, during the publicity for that book, you know, the biggest Chinese newspaper in America wrote a front page article about me and the book and the dancing. And I might have told my mother for those three years when I was dancing that I might have heavily implied that I was working as a computer specialist or a firm. <laughs> <of that. laughs> so yeah, that, I got really busted. Um, that. Oh. Leave it to the newspapers to bust somebody, right, John? Right. Oh, man. <laughs> I did it every day. I used to work for the Inquirer, uh, Philadelphia. I so, know. Uh, and, I know. Um, so, so, Gene, you know, you're a very accomplished person. I mean, that's the, that's the thing. I mean, no. most people don't know how to do all the things you know how to do. Um, but, for example, but, but, John, John, there are a lot of things more any normal people can do that I cannot do at all. So it bounces I out. in that way. Yeah. Yeah. Apparently cooking and cleaning are in those. Uh... Yeah, yeah. Cooking. I can't cook. <laughs> I can't clean. I can't drive. I have great admiration for people who can drive. It's extremely dangerous in anything with wheels. I can't huh. swim, you know, so there, there are a lot of things I'm way below average. Yeah. Uh, do you, um, I'm wondering, one of your accomplishments is that you're at least trilingual, right? You've, you've got Chinese. Uh, now, which uh, which major dialect of Chinese did you, were you raised in, Cantonese or Mandarin? Cantonese. 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 And um, you know Dutch. You're fluent in Dutch. And, of course, uh, you're much better than we are in English. So <laughs> I'm wondering if you find in this particular corner of your life uh, – are you different people in different languages? Are you the same old Gene, no matter what language you're using? Do you, do you feel more comfortable being Gene in Cantonese or Dutch or English? What do you think? John, that is, I think, the most excellent question I have ever gotten. And I've never gotten it before. Um, and, you know, it's kind of, <laughs> at the, <laughs> you should see him. Anyway, yes. But no, it is true. That is an excellent question because that is at the heart of my writing. And the truth is, I am a completely different person in each of those languages. And, um, you know, there's actually a tremendous amount of Dutch publicity right now for, you know, because of this whole book banning thing. And I have to do a lot of interviews in Dutch. And in fact, Dutch national TV is planning to pick me up from the airport when I land on Monday uh, back in the Netherlands. And they're going to film me immediately, like after like a 14 hour plane ride, you know, exhausted with no sleep in Dutch. And it is so much harder for me, um, to be articulate in Dutch. I mean, I speak Dutch. I'm fluent in Dutch, but I, my Dutch is not my English, you know, and my Chinese is not my Dutch. And one of the themes that I always play with in my books is how a person's exterior can be so different from their interior because a person who can be halting in English and, you know, we make judgments. I make judgments, you know, they can barely get the words out. They're making all kinds of grammatical mistakes. You know, you think they're not the brightest light in the Christmas tree, you know, like <laughs> yeah. I, you, we can't all be. So, you know, but the truth is in their own language, in their own culture, they can be a completely different human being. And that is something that I try to portray in all of my work. 
And I, I think that's really true because uh, certainly in, um, uh, in your novels, uh, switching languages, switching codes, uh, even using different uh, turns of speech uh, in Cantonese or English, um, uh, you have a very original way of bringing that off. And it's part of all of your novels so far that I've read. I haven't actually uh, uh, read your new one coming out in the fall, but I know that this is a big part of, uh, of how you make your characters live is the, is the language switching thing and, and, and people not being comfortable in the language or being comfortable only in one you know, like most Americans are, right? I mean, uh, <laughs> Americans don't like to learn languages. We just, there's sort of a cultural thing against it. You know, well, what it is, is that, you know, as Americans, we are so spoiled without knowing it because English is the international language, despite what they think in France. Um, you know, yeah. <laughs> and so uh, everywhere we go, everywhere we go, people bend over backwards to speak our language. And it's very easy to forget well, you know, how good is my Russian? How good is my Japanese, right? How good am I in their language? And you're like, well, no, they have to speak English because English is, you know, the king of the languages. But of course, it becomes hard for us to remember what it's like to, to be in the other language. And indeed, like in especially girl in translation and uh, searching for Sylvie Lee, I play with that because when we are in each narrator's head, we only speak their language. So when Kimberly Chang in Go in Translation, the protagonist, is learning English, people talk to her in English. And it's like in the Charlie Brown, you know, um, cartoons when the parents talk is like, rah, 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 rah. that's what she hears. She hears rah, 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 as she catches a word or two. And that's what the reader hears as well. So that the reader is not only reading about the immigrant experience, but actually undergoing it. Wonderful. Yeah, and speaking of uh, uh, decisions and, and choices you've made, why are you now living in the Netherlands? How did that come about? Well, I moved to the Netherlands because I met a guy um, and I married him. And I am now switching, you know, dividing my time between the Netherlands and New York because we are getting divorced. So in 2023, I am both divorced and banned. It's a great year, guys. Really? <laughs> 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 yeah, right? You know. Yeah. Moral of the story, but stay single. Yeah, but, but, at least, uh, <laughs> but at least in the Netherlands, they're picking you up and driving you to your house yeah. from, from oh, the yeah. airport. That seems like, yeah, that seems like they might like you. I don't know. It's... Mixed blessings. Right? No, I know. I love the Netherlands. I honestly, I don't know what I'm doing right now. You know, it's happened. It's happened very suddenly that my marriage has exploded. Wow. Um, and so I'm just kind of trying to figure out um, what I'm doing. I am going to spend the, new, uh, the summer in New York. So I'm excited about that. I'm going to spend a couple of months back home um, just to kind of figure out what I'm doing. Very good. Uh, in your novels, uh, um, you're fairly, um, you, you, you're not exactly uh, naive about the American dream, quote unquote, uh, they, you know, that it, it isn't, it doesn't, it isn't always what it seems to be. It isn't always there. Um, you have to sort of deal with it because we're all taught it. Right. And, uh, but it also, means you feel inadequate about half the time, right? Oh, I didn't achieve the American dream or something like this. But you're you you're very ambivalent about it, at least in the novels. Well, you know, I I think, you know, the American dream, like every dream, is complicated. Right? I mean, I you know, I love the American dream with all my heart. I actually really believe in it. I absolutely believe it exists. I believe that my life is so much better because my parents sacrificed everything to bring us to the United States. Uh, but was it easy? No. Was it without price? No. Are there people in my family who paid a heavier price than I did? Absolutely. Because I was the youngest. Um, it was the easiest for me. And I think that, you know, the older you are when you transplant, the more difficult it is. Yeah. So um, I think that it is complicated and it's, it's the, you know, that's why books are valuable. That's why I think books are challenged. You know, books need to question things like the American dream and everything else. That's what we're here for. Very definitely. Well, uh, Jean, 
I want to tell you that this has uh, been a, a fantastic half hour to just sit down and talk with you about not only the fact that uh, your life has been uh, 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 just amazing, but that you've taken up arms against this this big out there sort of golem move, move, <laughs> that's going movement. after yeah yeah uh, your book and several others uh, with some with some good knowledgeable uh, counter punches and I, I'm I'm very grateful for you. Uh, to you, rather, for, for doing that. Well, thank you guys so much for having me. It has been such a pleasure, and the, the time has just flown by. I can't believe it's uh, already time. Uh, Don, do you want to start recording now? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> Late April Fools. I'm sorry, Gene. Whoa, ho, ho. <laughs> yeah, thank you for being on the musical inner tube, and now you've gotten a taste of uh, of our craziness, but we got to know you, and that's, uh, that's a beautiful thing. Thank you. Thank you. I love you guys. Take care. And thank you for listening to The Musical Inner Tube. The Musical Inner Tube is available everywhere good podcasts are found. Listen on your favorite platform and give us a good rating. You can subscribe to the podcast on our website, musicalinnertube.com. There you can listen to all of our podcasts, see pictures and biographies of our guests, and contact us. You can even leave us a voicemail. And don't forget to leave your email address on our Talk to the Two page on the website, and we'll send you a preview of who's coming to talk with us by email, just so you're prepared. That's musicalinnertube.com. And as always, thanks to virtual band Car Radio Dog for our theme music. Music.